Hey, this is Matt Ertz, the Madison County Historian. We are still working to document how different businesses, people, and organizations have been impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. And we are very lucky today to have Dr. Siobhan Bongiovanni, uh, owner and veterinarian from Chittenango Animal Hospital. Thank you for being here, Dr. Bongiovanni. Um, for those that aren't familiar, I mean, we all know what veterinarians do, but talk a little bit about your practice. Thanks very much. I'm glad to be here. Glad to help preserve some of this information. So the Chenango Animal Hospital is in Chenango, which is in the northwest corner of Madison County. And we are, we started the pandemic as a five doctor practice. We are now a four doctor practice. One of my vets was already planning to relocate. So we have shrunk a little bit during this time, but we have about 11,000 clients Wow. which means somewhere in the realm of 30,000 patients that we help take care of from as far away as the Catskills up to St. Lawrence out towards Rochester and Albany. So we've got folks who travel quite a long ways to come as well as many people who live right within the town of Sullivan. Um, I have another 20 support staff that helps to take care of all of those patients and the clients and we um, spend our day primarily doing preventative care, but also doing um, emergent care and surgeries. Are you guys predominantly like domesticated animals or do you do agriculture at all or? Yeah, we are 99% we are small animals, dog, cats, very few um, pocket pets like hamsters and gerbils and those types. And I see a few um, wildlife exotics for a specific wildlife sanctuary. Okay. All right. So talk a little bit about when you guys, COVID kind of started to appear on your radar and when you guys maybe started to make plans for it. Yeah. So I was watching things developing um, really, I think, very on when the cases first started being reported from Wuhan um, and watching that. In addition to uh, being at the animal hospital, I'm also on our local school board. So how that might impact um, our community and my business were on the radar very early on. And being a medical professional, a lot of people were asking, what do we think, what do we think? Is this coming, is this gonna be in animals? So we started watching the numbers very carefully well before there were re US reported cases and um, we sort of saw the writing on the wall uh, as it was coming and we're hopeful like everyone was back then that it was going to be short-lived um, and in all honesty I didn't think we would have the ability in this country to lock down as strongly as we did. I thought people with their individual rights and very strong feelings about that would say no way to the kind of lockdown that was done in some other countries. So I was glad to be proved wrong that people really were able to distance, isolate, quarantine themselves. So talk about, we, we kind of use the county, for example, um, a lot of stuff started to change. A lot of the school districts started to close um, around the 13th. Uh, and then the county announced, the state actually announced that all businesses went to half capacity on the 16th and by the 20th we were closed or paused right. as they like to say. So talk about how you guys had to respond to that because I'm assuming veterinarians were at least partially a, an essential business um, right. and then what that entailed for you. So um, as we move towards that complete shutdown, we had already um, had signs on the door um, you know, limiting some access, trying to do things curbside. Um, when the lockdown actually occurred, at the first few days, we didn't know for sure if we were considered essential or not. We are awaiting guidance from the New York State Veterinary Medical Society that was in communication with um, the governor's office and with the Department of Agriculture. And it was determined that for emergent care and rabies vaccines, we were allowed to keep operating. So at the very beginning um, of the pandemic, we basically closed the doors to clients coming into the building unless it was an end of life period of time or their pet was um, unmanageable by our staff without the owner. So for a safety reason. 
And um, at the beginning, of course, we had been told by the government no masks were required. We were questioning um, people if they had symptoms, if they had any symptoms at all, they were not allowed in the building. Um, and the same thing with the staff. Um, they were being you know, told if you have symptoms, you must stay home, you must call in. We were able to keep um, the vast majority of our staff on premises and working. I have one staff member who is over 70. So um, based on Matilda's laws, not really a law, um, I required her to stay home, although she was able to work partly at home. Um, and I had um, a few people with pre-existing conditions who voluntarily furloughed themselves. And I um, asked my teenage workers, the high school kids, not to come in. But other than that, everyone else stayed um, at something between 75% and full time, depending on their situation and their skills. Okay. So as this goes on, um, we talked a few weeks ago to the director of public health, and he talked about you know, you guys are inundated with information almost on a daily basis, kind of, let's just say adjusting what you might be doing. Um, so talk about that process of you guys are trying to make sure you're providing the best care you can for animals, but also you're having to adapt on the fly to, as things change. Right. So um, it, it was great in the sense that the New York, New York State had um, sort of guidelines that were out there. Our state VMS had guidelines out there. So taking them from various resources, the CDC, the state information, um, and the fact that we already deal with infectious disease on a daily basis, really we needed very little adjustment to our internal protocols. The cleansers, disinfectants we use were already certified for coronavirus. So we just ramped up our record keeping and our frequency of cleaning all surfaces. And one thing I think that gets missed sometimes is we really paid attention to how long it takes a disinfectant to kill. Wiping a surface down doesn't work. It has to be wet and allowed to air dry. And that's something that people miss often. In the fine print, it says, you know, two minutes contact time, five minutes contact time. If you wipe and it dries in 30 seconds, you haven't killed anything on that surface. And we realize that because we've been dealing with oh, rabies and parvovirus and all these other, you know, deadly and infectious diseases, some to humans, some to other animals for a very long time. So we just, you know, paid more attention to that. We made sure we had PPE. We made sure we were staying distance. It was very hard for the staff to, to be having me come around with a yardstick going, nope, nope, that's six feet. Like we had it marked on the floor. We had it marked on the countertops. Uh, had people at different workstations move things around to really get into people's heads that the distance mattered. Finally, once we got better guidance, the face masks mattered. Of course, washing and hand sanitizing we do regularly anyway, but we're more on top of it. Um, so all of those had to be adjusted for. Um, of course, very hard on our clients to be sitting out in the parking lot while we're bringing their, their, their babies, their little fur babies into the hospital. Um, and then gosh, early on, it was still cold. Yeah. So I'm standing out there in my scrubs in the snow, talking to people about their animal's health at their car window. Um, and now I'm standing out there in my scrubs, 95 <laughs> degrees, talking to them at their car window about their pet's um, health. So, um, we made a lot of adjustments and we continue to watch the changes and in information that are coming in every single day. Do you find that as, as a father of two fur babies, technically three, <laughs> but one doesn't like the vets, um, <laughs> as I have two dogs and I know I have one dog that is terrified of the vet's office and we can barely get her in by ourselves. Not that she acts bad. She just doesn't want to be there. So did yeah. you find that your patients struggled a little more with not having their owners around? So um, a lot of owners won't want to hear it, but once they get past the threshold, most of the animals we have even marked down as very fearful, very anxious, have been pretty darn relaxed without having to worry about what their owner is feeling and doing and where they are. When that human is separate from the equation, they really have less to be afraid of because they don't have to take care of themselves and they're human. 
and so many animals that we used to have shaking and salivating are oh i'll have a cookie you've never had a cookie they, they want to take a cookie now it's not across the board some of these animals are still very anxious um and you know we've been trained we work hard to try to remove as much anxiety as we can and for some of those animals it means their human people come in with their mask on and and so forth we have a check-in station where we take temperatures ask you know have you been exposed are you living with anyone who's been exposed Do you have any symptoms not violating any hipaa we don't record you know anything specific um, and then we do a, a deep sanitation of the room after the client leaves so it takes a little more effort it takes a little more time but when the animal needs their human we try to make sure that that can happen early on there was reports of, of dogs specifically getting covid although it I still don't know if they've actually said whether or not they can give it. So right. was there any fear from your office early on of, 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 of pets bringing in the disease? Yep. So we look at it from two different aspects. When um, it was, and we still believe that COVID can rest on surfaces and survive on surfaces for some period of time. Viral load is always an important consideration. So somebody with covid walks by a surface they're not leaving much virus behind somebody coughs all over the surface they're leaving the virus behind so if they are coughing all over their pet the pet could have live virus on them for a period of time until it grooms itself or the virus dies its own death so that was one concern and then the other concern is could the animal a cat or a dog have the virus in its respiratory tract. So they have tested, I, last I heard there were three dogs who have tested positive in the US. There's been an assortment of cats and of course the news made a big deal about the large cats uh, like at the Bronx Zoo who have caught it. And I saw a report recently that ferrets as well. So um, right now to the best of our scientific information, the virus can cause symptoms in those animals, but there has been no um, transmission that we know of from those animals to people. Um, from a scientific point of view, I can't believe that it is impossible, but it doesn't seem to be a major factor. And there have been tens of thousands, perhaps hundreds of thousands of pets who have lived with the now, how many cases have we had right. in the US? Almost 3 million. Yeah. So um, there, there, there should have been provable transmission by now if somebody was looking for it. Okay. Okay. So uh, talk a little bit about how um, COVID is going to impact your business and your practice moving forward, because yep. it seems like nobody likes the phrase new normal, but there is some level <laughs> of new normal. So when I had, I had had the idea that when New York State went to phase four and people could dine in restaurants, we would be able to invite fur parents, owners back into the clinic. And um, it really became clear that in order to do that and do it safely, we would have to decrease our total number of patients that we were able to see. We'd have to cut back the number of practitioners seeing patients at one time so that we had exam rooms that were big enough, spaces that were big enough, and we could clean in between. And given the volume um, of business going on, there really right now is no way to do that and still be able to see as many people as call in every day. So for the time being, our new normal is that we're bringing patients in we're taking care of them, we're bringing them back out, report cards, doing curbside care, continuing to do a lot of sanitizing, continuing to wear masks and distancing for um, people picking up medications and foods and other products. We have them you know, pay in their car, we bring the paid for product right out to the car. Uh, we finally, it only took three months, numbered the parking spaces. Don't know why it took me three months to figure I could take a can of spray paint and people could say, yeah, I'm in spot 15 instead of I'm facing route five, not too far. Oh, it was crazy. We'd be like, okay, I'm in the red Mazda. Every car in the parking lot's red. <laughs> What's a <laughs> Mazda symbol look like? That was, uh, that was crazy. We had to be um, really good car identifiers for a bit. Um, 
do you think this will have long-term implications on how you do it? I think um, it probably will, but how long is long-term? Um, I, would, I would expect we have at least as long as we've already been through to prove that our local spread is under good control. If that remains true, then I think we probably will start to see more you know, person to person contact. I think that in, as we move forward, we will have to still be wearing masks, be cleaning, be washing, be keeping the distance. And it's really hard, um, but we are, we have an embarrassingly large number of cases and we are doing as a nation an embarrassingly horrible job of controlling that. And um, we don't know if there's going to be herd immunity. We don't know if people can get this again. Um, there's so much that we don't know and that's not surprising. There's things we don't know about diseases that have been around a thousand years. People learn new things about diabetes every time and they've documented that to ancient times. So um, we can't expect to know everything about this in such a short period of time. So that's, I hope, I sometimes feel I'm not completely answering your question. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's a hard thing. And as we've talked to different groups, a lot of them have hoped for normal and a lot of, a lot of manufacturers have said it's probably gonna change forever how they set up their assembly lines, for example. Mm -hmm. And you may not have people that are near each other ever again because they found they can make the same product and in a similar amount of time and have distance in between. Um, so that, that's why we ask and, and nobody knows for sure because mm -hmm. yeah. like you said, you know, this could go on for heaven help us years mm -hmm. um, yeah. or it could be something that we find a reasonable vaccine for that works um, and maybe next year we, we go back to the old normal. Um, but I, yeah, I think, some new disease. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah, no, that, that was, was next, but I think where that won't be forever. Yeah. And um, if some new disease doesn't come, that piggybacks along with us. Um, you know, one thing that you mentioned and in, in that um, is part of our work environment is that my coworkers and I cannot social distance because when we are giving vaccines and drawing blood and doing nail trims and taking care of pets, we are as close to each other as that pet is large. And if it's a three pound pet, we are pretty darn close. Um, and so I, I have this uh, poster on the wall that I drew for my, uh, my uh, staff and I, and I like it. So the center of the flower is you yourself, the individual. And then the first set of petals are all the people we're in contact with at work. So we are all one group who are not social distancing as well as we could. And in that same group are our family members because we are as in touch with them as they, we are with the people they live with. And then there's all the people those people are in touch with and really trying to get, you know, people from as my youngest employee right now is 15 years old and my oldest is 73 and they have an equally difficult time getting the fact that the person they're in contact with at Walmart is now in contact with me. And that's, that's what a lot of people have struggled with is this idea of every person you come in contact with, and you may not know you came in contact with them. You may no. walk down the aisle after they coughed and have no comprehension that you came in contact. And especially in enclosed spaces, we know that when you're in enclosed spaces, it yep. lives for a little while and you could walk mm -hmm. through something that happened yep a minute or two ago and have no comprehension of what you just did. And um, that's where, you know, we sort of were getting with, if you, someone with COVID coughed on that dog and now I'm hugging that dog to me, I may have picked up virus particle. Now I have quite a bit of training and I'm going to wash carefully and I'm going to realize my clothes may be infected, but is my 15 year old lab, uh, you know, kennel kid. And definitely the 73 year old office worker doesn't, God bless her. She's been working there for 50 years. She's not going to get it. <laughs> it's, it's not in her realm of where things go in yeah. her brain. And that's true. There's just, I have a 93 year old grandmother who is still going out and shopping because that's what she does. Yep. Um, yep. So, and, and you can tell them no, but yep. that's what they've done all their life. That's the way they want to live. 
Do we still have to wear a mask? Yes, you still have to wear a mask. <laughs> I don't think that's going away for a long time, unfortunately. Um, is there anything else you'd like to say to your patients and, and folks, uh, you know, of, about, you know, what's going on? Yeah. So the main thing is that we are treating every pet like we always have. In other words, like they're part of our family. Um, we enjoy them, we want the best for them, and we really, really miss the people. We, um, we miss the contact with them, we miss chatting with them, hearing about um, the things they do with their pets, the things that they do with their kids, the vacations they go on, all the things that just come up as you are interacting with someone for 20 or 30 minutes um, along with their pet's health. We miss all of that terribly and we want it back. But more importantly, we want that client to be there and be alive next year. And we want our staff to be alive and be there next year and our loved ones. Um, so right now we are willing and must sacrifice that so that we can take care of as many of our patients as we can as safely as we can and make sure um, we are doing our part to keep infection rates low and um, you know take do our part for public health. I think that's spectacular. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Um, hopefully we do not have to talk again, but if things continue on for a while, I might give you a call to see how you're doing. Uh, that would be great. Thank you and we will talk to you soon. Thanks Matt, take care. Yeah.